Hi everyone, how's it going? My name's Colin Brooks and I'm a proud member of the Phys Edagogy and Phys Ed Summit crew. And I just wanna say thank you so much for joining us today for this huge global health and physical education digital conference. Um, we really couldn't make this happen without you. And I just wanna personally thank you for taking the time to help spread the word about the Phys Ed Summit 3.0. Currently we have over a thousand people RSVP'd for the Phys Ed Summit 3.0, ready to enjoy this professional development uh, conference at the, at the ease of their homes. So thank you for that. By sharing at least with one other person, you've helped impact the lives of hundreds of students. Um, so please continue to help us by spreading the word about this digital conference movement. Now, I just want to remind you that uh, we're using technology today. And whenever we use technology, we, we all know that some things don't always go the way that, they, that we'd like them to go. However, if you do experience some problems within the tozzle, uh, the pin board in which you're watching this uh, presentation, just refresh the tozzle. And if there's still problems, get a hold of one of us on the Phys Ed Summit 3.0 crew and we'll help you as soon as we can. After the Phys Ed Summit 3.0 is over, um, we'd love for you to fill out a survey on the Phys Ed Summit 3.0 homepage. Now, when you fill out this survey, it gives us great feedback for Phys Ed Summit 4.0, and it also allows you to receive a professional development certificate of participation. So, with that being said, um, I would like to introduce our next presenter. His name is Gary Lemke, and he is a physical education teacher from the United States talking about blended learning today. Thanks a lot, Gary, and thanks for watching. This is not your grandparents' physical education. It's time to check your preconceptions at the door. The future of physical education is here today with the use of blended learning to teach the skills, knowledge, and confidence for a lifetime of physical activity. Today we're going to discover how forward-thinking physical, physical educators bring physical literacy to life in the real world through relevancy, relationship, and rigor. We're going to learn how a balanced kinetic academic curriculum ignites student engagement through the discovery of fitness personalities. And we're going to find out how to use technology to teach without having to teach technology. Hi, my name is Gary Lemke, and I'm so happy you've decided to join the conversation about blended learning today. Now, did the phrase, the next big thing, draw you in? Did it make you think, well, before we talk about the next big thing, what was the last big thing? We're not here to debate the past, but we're here to chart a course to a better future. But saying something is the next big thing is a bold statement. And that means the claim comes with high expectations. And I know that. And I certainly hope to honor your time and to back it up today. So right up front, let me say this is not pie in the sky. And it's not something that requires a big investment of time uh, or money. In fact, at the end of this session, I will offer up to five willing school teachers the opportunity to fully implement a complete blended learning curriculum, much of what I'm gonna show you today, that you can have up and running at your school this coming Monday morning. So please make a note of my contact information. My email is glemke at interactivepe.com or my Twitter handle is at lemke, L-E-M-K-E. So let me ask you a question. Who is the most famous cyclist of all time? It's probably not who you think. Take a look at the gentleman over my shoulder here. His name is Marshall Walter Major Taylor. He's an American cyclist who won the world championship in 1899 after setting numerous world records and overcoming racial discrimination. Taylor was the first African-American athlete to achieve the level of world champion and only the second black man to win a world championship after Canadian boxer George Dixon. Taylor's career was held back by racism, which is why he often participated abroad. In a 1902 European tour, 
He entered 57 races, and he won 40 of those 57 races, defeating the champions of Germany, England, and France. I mentioned Major Taylor today because I'm an avid cyclist, and because Mr. Taylor and I both are from Indiana. For those of you who don't know where Indiana is, let me give you a little bit of perspective. But first, before we talk about the big thing called Earth, let's talk about the next big thing called the Moon. I want to take you to two places on the Moon. The first uh, was where Apollo 11 landed, uh, the first spacecraft with Neil Armstrong to uh, land on the Moon. And uh, that uh, obviously was followed up by many other Apollo missions, the last one being Apollo 17. The last man on the moon was a man by the name of Gene Cernan. Uh, and obviously by that point in time, they took more than just uh, the module. They actually had uh, a rover, and uh, you can see some of the tracks that uh, the uh, uh, astronauts took uh, when they traveled on the moon there. And here's a perspective of uh, what it might have uh, uh, looked like uh, with uh, the uh, lunar lander as well as the uh, rover on the moon. So why do I bring up the first and the last man, Neil Armstrong and Gene Cernan? Well, they also share an Indiana connection. They both went to Purdue University where they uh, got their engineering degrees and uh, obviously then entered into uh, NASA. So Purdue is in Indiana. And in fact, uh, uh, more astronauts have uh, graduated from Purdue than anywhere else. And uh, as we zoom in on uh, the flatlands of Indiana, uh, there isn't uh, much uh, very interesting in terms of uh, 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 oceans or mountains. Uh, but I do want to uh, point out one scene here, uh, which is uh, this is a statue of Neil Armstrong in front of uh, the building named after him at uh, Purdue University. Now, Carmel, Indiana, which is where I am, is just a, a few counties uh, over. And uh, as we zoom into uh, Carmel, I'm going to focus on our high school because uh, we're talking about blended learning at the high school level. Carmel High School is a fantastic uh, uh, educational establishment uh, with a, a lot of emphasis on uh, athleticism. Uh, it has a, a great uh, fitness facility, uh, uh, an aquatic center, a field house, uh, as well as uh, soccer fields, a great cross-country course, uh, and the football field there. We're also known as a city with uh, more roundabouts than any other uh, uh, one in the United, any other town in the United States. In fact, here's an example of a double roundabout, uh, uh, an exit off of a highway. So Indiana, what's uh, it also famous for? Uh, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. So uh, obviously that uh, might uh, ring a bell, and that's just, just uh, down the road from us here. And we'll zoom in and uh, I'll show you uh, uh, the view of this uh, two and a half mile oval, uh, which is uh, quite a quite a marvel here. I'm going to take our little man and give you a close up here and uh, show you what it might look like if we were uh, um, standing on the track uh, at the uh, Indianapolis Motor Speedway here and uh, get a perspective of cars coming um, at you over 200 miles an hour down the uh, main straightaway here. And of course, uh, as you know, uh, the uh, famous start finish line is uh, designated by the one yard of bricks because uh, the original uh, brick yard was uh, the, the original track was made of bricks. Now, this isn't a big story about things like the Earth or the moon or African-American world champions or the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. This is about other things that are just as big or maybe bigger. There's a story of Brock a 380-pound student who hated physical education for many, many reasons, but through blended learning was able to make an intellectual connection with physical activity and discover a physical uh, personality, a fitness personality that uh, allowed him to find that swimming was a place where he could be physically active and not overheat and sweat. To the point that his mother came in to school talk to the teacher crying that they he she didn't know what they had done with his Brock because now he found that physical education was his favorite class this is a story about Neil Neil probably didn't weigh a hundred pounds definitely under five feet wasn't uh, uh, gifted with many of the athletic genes from his mother and his father but discovered the importance of being physically active came in at the end of the spring semester wearing a medal, having run 
a half marathon by himself, motivated to find his fitness personality. It's a story about Anna Catherine, who with blended learning brought a whole academic curriculum home to do with her parents. Anna Catherine, being a Down syndrome student, uh, found a way to be physically active every day in class. She had her routine, and she had a very supportive set of parents who found that Anna Catherine learned very well in an online environment. And it's the story of Ronnie, who had absolutely no problems dunking a ball and dazzling those around him, but didn't understand that there was more to being physically active and physically fit than just using the talents on a basketball court. And this is about the story of countless other students that had their own story and their own journey and bring their own biases of what they didn't like about physical education and are changing their whole perspective. And why is that important? Well, we need to go back to what our goal is in terms of physical education. And if we look at uh, uh, this set of standard or this uh, standards description as adapted by uh, Shape America, I want to pull out some very key phrases here. We're talking about physically literate individuals with the knowledge, the skills, and the confidence to enjoy a lifetime of healthful physical activity. Look at those key words that are jumping off that page. Literacy, knowledge, lifetime, enjoyment. Those are all key things that need to be towards our goal and to understand that it's not just about physical activity, that physical education needs to be a balance of academics and activity which can be a challenge given the limited amount of time that we have with students for physical education. Now let me fast forward, not to the first day of high school as a freshman, but the last day on graduation. Consider this. The students are in their caps and gowns. Their names are being called as they walk across the stage to get their diploma. The music's going. And all of a sudden, the superintendent says, stop and picks on a student randomly who happens to be walking up to get his degree, his diploma. And he says, sir, what did you learn in physical education? Would that person be able to answer? Would they be able to answer in a way that makes the physical education department proud? What if someone asked you, what do we want our students to learn in physical education? Going back to those standards that we just went for, or we just went through, I'll put it very simply in these terms. We want every student to say, I learn to move. It's just that simple. They learn to move, they learn they need to move, and they learn that they need to move for a lifetime. So let's get back to these terms here, blended learning. Some people will call it the flipped uh, classroom or flipped teaching. And really what we're talking about here is an approach that uses class time for active learning because most of the information is learned outside of class. And what that means is that we're not going to take away any second of physical education class time for academics or for non-activity oriented uh, sorts of education. We're going to use, let technology do that for us. We're going to do that through online delivery of content and instruction and allow students to do it their way, on their time, uh, in a way that uh, makes sense for them and uh, fits their individual learning styles. They have control. They need to own their fitness. They need to own their fitness education. So one way to look at this is that we want them to have an intellectual journey. We want them to have an academic experience. And we want to bring that knowledge to life every single day in physical education class when they are physically active in whatever the activity or the kinetic curriculum uh, demands that day. So we can bring to life. Uh, it's, it's very much like, a, for instance, uh, a biology teacher who uh, goes over the digestive system of an animal and lectures about uh, how that actually uh, 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 is, is constructed and how that uh, happens. 
And then later in the week, they go into the lab and they dissect the animal and it comes to life. And what they learned academically, uh, they are actually learning by experience. The same thing is happening here. In fact, I will contend that blended learning and flipped teaching may be educational concepts that are best suit are better suited for physical education than any other subject that students have. I've mentioned this a few times, and I really want to go over this a little bit more. I don't think you can have a kinetic curriculum without an academic curriculum. And you can't have an academic curriculum without a kinetic curriculum. If we're going to talk physical literacy and physically literate individuals, academics and kinetics need to be in balance. And that doesn't mean splitting the class time in half for each of those, but it doesn't mean sacrificing one for the other. And again, if we go for that goal of I learned to move, I learned to move because I found something I enjoyed. I learned to move for a lifetime. And I learned about what meaningful physical activity is all about. So having a balance, making sure that uh, we are uh, um, uh, putting equal weight on both academics and kinetics is the way to physical literacy. It's a way to master the knowledge. And it's a way to use physical education, physical activity during class as the lab or the way to bring physical education to life. Now, many people, when I bring this up, talk about the, uh, what I call the curriculum paradox. It's like, gosh, we can't add academics to PE because we don't have enough time with students as it is. We don't want to take away anything. The interesting thing in the paradox here is, is by adding an academic curriculum, and doing it in a blended learning way so that it's done outside of the classroom, teachers are finding they have more time for physical activity, activity. They have a higher degree of engagement in that physical activity. And the goal of hot, sweaty messes in a, a single period is something that is achieved more often with a higher percent percentage of the student population. So what are some of these questions that students are asking? What, are, what is the best activity for overall fitness? Is fitness more important than body weight? Does exercise make me smart? What causes muscle soreness? Should I eat before or after I exercise? Are there different types of stretching? What are some of the myths and misconceptions about strength training? Does exercise help relieve stress? And how do I strengthen my heart? So these are all questions regardless whether you're an athlete or not, these are questions that uh, students have regardless of the kinetic curriculum and the activities and the sports uh, that you do. These are things that students uh, have on their mind and they want answers to. And we put it in a way that uh, makes the relevancy and the connection with them and then is, uh, uh, and, and put it in the real world for something they can use for a lifetime itself. These, uh, I mentioned that uh, we have uh, uh, two blended learning curriculums of what we call PE1 and PE2. Uh, these are the major uh, units in each of them. And as you can see, we put a lot of focus from the student perspective here. So what's the primary word you see in almost every unit here? It's your. We talk about your fitness safety, your sportsmanship, your body, your nutrition, your strength, your flexibility, your cardio your fitness brain, your motivation, your fitness intensity. And uh, in, in the one that's circled here, you see your fitness potential. Uh, basically, that will break down into uh, uh, four different lessons in this example here. What are fitness principles? What does it mean to train to peak? How does progressive overload work? What are the best habits of highly fit people? So as I said, very uh, straightforward relevant questions for students to master in each of these units of study here. So we'll get into the lessons themselves a little bit here, and, um, and I'll show you some examples. But what are students saying? We do ask, uh, believe it or not, one of the things we do in each of the courses is we ask them to, to tell us what they think about the course, what they think about their experience. And uh, that's a very, very frightening thing to ask students what they think, but it's also a way to measure how effective the educational experience is. And I am here to tell you today that uh, 
the feedback that we get uh, is just phenomenal. I gave you the anecdotes of four individuals, uh, students there. I could give you additional stories about uh, so many different students and having so many different personal situations that have to do with fitness, have to do with what's on their mind, have to do with their struggles, has to do with their, self -perce their perception of themselves and their relationship with others. But as you can see by the comments here, high degree of motivation, a focus on health, making the connection, an understanding of the importance, the idea of making better decisions, a focus to uh, make fitness and, and physical activity a priority, and to spend more time doing it. So I think uh, um, you know what you see here and what we teach is that uh, the, the things that people are most likely to do are the things they enjoy. So if we can't make that enjoyment connection, our ability to have that student walk across the stage and say, I learned to move, uh, goes way down if we haven't made the connection of what they enjoy. Very, very interesting thing about blended learning, especially with the use of technology, is we have some data. We have a lot of data. In fact, the data that's come out of interactive PE and blended learning in physical education has really been the envy of educators in other departments, in mathematics, social studies, English, uh, whatever it might be. And what we have found here is that when the administ administrator, the principal, says, hey, are you highly effective? Teachers are usually going to say, yeah, I think I am. And then the answer is going to or the response is going to be, prove it. And now we have the tools to give teachers the artifacts and the data to prove it. And we have seen more often than not, uh, teachers are now able to go in and hit many of the educational and academic domains better than the traditional academic uh, subjects or teachers in the traditional academic subjects here. So the uh, obviously in many or uh, many schools, uh, uh, teachers are being encouraged to use technology more, uh, to uh, do more cross-curricular uh, teaching, and these are all things that we have uh, the ability to demonstrate, and not just say that we're doing anecdotally for one lesson. It's integrated deep into the DNA of blended learning for a whole curriculum, a whole semester. While I said blended learning offers quite a bit of uh, data, sometimes it's better to have one particular figure that's really meaningful and easy to understand than too much data, which can be confusing in the sea of, uh, of, of information. I call this a measured learning or the uber student learning objective. When someone says, are your students learning? Here's a piece of data that answers that question very definitively. One of the things we do with blended learning is on day one, we ask students to take a pre-course evaluation to tell us how much they know and what their level of proficiency is with fitness fundamentals and fitness knowledge. We then, at the end of the course, reevaluate the student's knowledge and proficiency during the final exam. So we can compare what they have learned and what they've demonstrated they've learned in the final exam and compare that with the baseline the pre-course evaluation. Here's some data from a school recently where we see that about 1% of the population prior, on the prior to the course on the first day was able to be, uh, was able to demonstrate being highly efficient, proficient. Likewise, about 63% of the student population at the beginning of the course demonstrated through their pre-course evaluation that they were not proficient at all in terms of fitness knowledge. Now, by the end of the course, after they had completed the curriculum, the lessons, the assignments, the quizzes, the questions, and all that sort of thing, that 1% that was highly efficient, one out of 100 students, increased to 92%, or more than 9 out of 10 students were able to demonstrate being highly proficient. We had achieved our objective in terms of the standards of giving them the knowledge and the literacy for a lifetime of healthful physical activity. Likewise, we had taken 63% of the population that was not proficient, did not have the knowledge, and in other words, the majority, six out of 10 students, 
and we were able to drive that number down to one out of a hundred or one percent uh, we're not able to demonstrate that knowledge or proficiency so in this case the uber student learning objective is that we have taken the population uh, uh, and made them highly proficient and we've taken the non-proficient population and driven that down to almost zero sometimes they say a picture is worth a thousand words and perhaps a demo or uh, a little bit of insight into what the student experiences might be worth uh, even more than a thousand words so rather than make this presentation a demonstration of everything that blended learning is and can be I'm just going to give you some highlights here but let me uh, uh, offer this if you're interested in uh, understanding more about the student experience uh, please contact me and I would be glad to give you course credentials so you can experience the full course uh, as if you were a student and get the uh, feel uh, I'll tell you right now that uh, almost every teacher that goes through this uh, basically uh, comes uh, out the other end and says oh my gosh how do I use this anyway what we see here is the uh, um, introduction screen that a student would see when they log in for the first time it is uh, not a full course here but basically only one thing do this first the pre-course evaluation we just talked about that start here the whole curriculum it's actually uh, sitting behind uh, uh, the the system here but we really want to keep the uh, the attention focused on the one thing that they want to, uh, we want them to do first so what they'll do is they'll click on the pre-course evaluation they'll answer some questions and be able to uh, uh, tell us what they know a couple other things and I'll go over this a little bit more here but uh, one of the things that's important is uh, due dates and deadlines uh, the awesome thing about blended learning is that the course can be done at the student's pace when the student is available when the student is ready in, in a way that makes sense for them however semesters have a beginning and they have an end so it can be done when they want at the pace they want but it has to be done before the end of the semester and so we've baked into the system a schedule based on each school's uh, uh, academic calendar that tells a student if they're ahead or behind if they're with the pace ahead of the pace or behind the pace of the class here and we call this the progress tracker and as you can see here uh, uh, there's a, uh, a carrot where uh, that denotes what today's date is and anything in red demonstrates what should be done at this point in time anything to the left of the carrot um, is what should be done if it's uh, been done it will be green if it hasn't been done it will be red future dates are in blue as you see here so the student has the ability very visually to understand how they are doing with the course now let me take you out of uh, student mode here and go back to teacher mode so you can see the full course so after the student does the first assignment they'll be able to go to the starting line and to do the first lesson which is welcome to interactive PE upon completion of welcome to interactive PE it will open up the next lesson what is required for this course when they complete that it will open up the next one how does interactive PE work and so on and so forth once they get done with the unit they'll move to the next unit how do they know if they're done to the right here you'll see check boxes as they complete the course the check boxes will be checked for them so they can uh, see exactly how far into the course they are we can open up the whole course here and you can see that there are about four perhaps five lessons uh, in each unit going all the way to the final here and we found that the best way to practice for the final uh, or to study for the final is to take short quizzes so the uh, students have the ability to repeat their practice finals with random questions uh, as many times as they wish one of the things I'll mention here is that we feel that uh, um, journaling is a very good fitness habit so one of the things that uh, 
uh, we uh, ask the students to do is to complete a participation journal each week. These participation journals will ask them and reinforce many of the concepts that we want to, them to be thinking about. How many days of the week were you active? We uh, want students to know that they should be active every single day. And we want them to know that they should be active 60 minutes or more every single day. So we ask them how many minutes uh, uh, during the, each day or, or for the week were they active. We ask them if they enjoyed what they did. We ask them what kind of things they did. Did it apply uh, to flexibility, cardio, and strength are three of the primary areas there or some combination. We ask them how likely they are to do the activities that they did this week for a lifetime. We ask them about intensity. Did the things they do this week, did it lead to a higher de degree of fitness? So we want them not only to be active, but we want them to understand that intensity or getting your heart rate up into a heart rate training zone at a moderate or higher level is important to increasing your level of fitness. So we do this on a weekly basis. One, because we know that journaling is a fitness habit. The more people journal, uh, the more likely they are to be uh, active on a regular basis here. So this we feel, um, as you can see here, not only the participation, we're now offering points for something besides putting your gym shoes and your gym shorts on, for something besides effort and uh, uh, being involved and uh, behavior. Oh, um, now that we're in teacher mode here, one of the things that I'll point out is that a teacher can uh, very quickly get a bird's eye view of the progress report of each student. So I can uh, order these to uh, see how my students are doing in a particular class here. And uh, I can see that uh, I've, I've obviously, uh, as like most uh, student populations, will have our overachievers or rabbits that are working ahead. And as you can see by the green bars here that they are uh, on schedule or above. Uh, the uh, pace of the course here and we can scroll down to the names here and as you can see uh, students are completing their work very very well they're staying on target and then uh, um, just as we have our overachievers we're going to have some folks that uh, maybe are a little bit behind perhaps they've been sick uh, perhaps uh, 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 employment family matters or whatever has put them behind yeah, but the great thing here is that uh, even if you've been absent you have the ability to catch up even if you've been distracted, you have the ability to catch up. That's the great thing about blended learning at your own time, at your pace, obviously within the confines of the beginning and the end of the course. But a teacher has the ability to identify those students who may need a little individual attention and to understand their personal situation to make sure that they are uh, staying on target and on track. So let me drill down a little bit into more detail. As I mentioned before, each lesson is set up with a very short YouTube length uh, lesson that goes over the details of what we want the student to know. And then we reinforce that learning with a few questions at the end of the lesson. So let's just take one an example here. What is the best activity for overall fitness? As you can see, the lesson is set up as a question, just as all the lessons are, a, less, a, a question that a student might ask. It brings up the video the here, best activity for overall and we're not going to go through and listen to all this uh, 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 video here, but uh, we also have, uh, uh, if the student is in uh, a place where uh, they can't uh, listen, uh, we do have closed caption for, uh, uh, that's also very helpful for those that may be uh, hearing impaired, as well as those that uh, might have English as a new language. So. The student will watch the whole uh, lesson here. I'll go to the end because uh, one of the things that we do talk about is uh, the uh, uh, ending every session with the big idea. So what is the best activity? Uh, the, the big idea here is, is we uh, suggest that people find something they enjoy that involves continuous motion and elevates your heart rate. The reason we think that is the best activity is because if someone doesn't enjoy something, they're not likely to do it. And even if it has great physical benefits, they don't get those benefits if they're not going to do it on a regular basis. So rather than finding that perfect physical activity, 
finding the one that fits their fitness personality, something they enjoy, something they look forward to, is really what we want to uh, have as the primary message here. So they've taken the lesson. And then uh, basically, uh, if they feel comfortable with the, if they viewed and feel comfortable with the material, they hit the, I'm ready to take the quiz. And it's just a few different questions here. For instance, for overall fitness, your activity should meet all but which of the criteria here. Uh, something that involves a range of uh, muscles, especially leg muscles, something you enjoy, continuous exercise at an elevated heart rate, or something likely to cause injury. Well, I don't think that's the right criteria, so they can submit that. They get immediate feedback uh, that they got it correct. They can move on to the next question. Some sports and activities might be enjoyable but may not improve fitness. We do talk about that, uh, that uh, there are many, many activities that are great, but they may not really add to your overall uh, health and well-being. So we're going to put that as a true statement and again uh, get feedback. The answer is correct. We move on. And then uh, the next question, which of the following statements is not true? And we did in the lesson talk about running. Uh, if you're not sure what uh, you enjoy, uh, just start moving. And so, uh, we, but we also talk about uh, um, uh, when you run long distances that that puts a lot of uh, a force on your feet. Uh, uh, we do talk about running as a popular form of fitness, so we know this is the one that's not true here. Um, but it, we know that it elevates the heart rate and it places the load on the muscular skeletal system, which can improve strength and bone density. So we talk about the benefits of running as well. So we submit that. And again, we're doing a great job here. We continue on. And then at the end, we can say, hey, how did you do? And uh, the student can uh, say, well, I think I did pretty well and I'm ready to move on. Or they can say, yeah, I'm not sure I really did as well as I'd hoped. Um, and they can go back and review the material and take the quiz for a better grade. And as I mentioned before, the grade that they can get, they can take this quiz as many times as they want until they have mastered the material there. So they submit and it will take them to the next lesson. They'll say, great job. And then it will take them to the next lesson, which is how often should I be active? Some of you, after watching that demo, may be going, oh, I get it. I know what blended learning is now. It's online PE. If that's the conclusion you've come to, I'm glad you stayed with us this far, but I really want to set the record straight. Blended learning is not online PE. Let me tell you what's going on with physical education. I think it's the, uh, that's a subject that's under assault in many school districts. There's a race to the top in terms of academics. And one of the casualties of that race to the top is that physical education is on a roller coaster, on a different roller coaster, on a race to the bottom. That's because many school districts are saying, we want to make room in a student's schedule for more academics. So we're going to look at uh, sports or other activities like marching band and make that count for physical education. Because activity is activity, isn't it? We have other districts that say, hey, we want our students to be able to take online PE so that they can take uh, uh, other electives uh, or have the opportunity to free up their schedule to do other things. This is the point, and this is the magic. This is the big idea why I think blended learning is the big idea here. When you have a balanced curriculum of kinetics and academics, you now have a program that is high stakes. Not high stakes like mathematics or language arts because it's being tested at the state level, but it's high stakes because we're talking about the health and well-being of a person for the rest of their life here. And with a balanced curriculum of kinetics and academics, if you're just kinetics, then the waiver is an option. If you're just academics, online is an option. But when you have both academics and kinetics in a meaningful way that meet the standards, neither the waiver nor online itself is a viable option. So the big idea here is to turn that race to the bottom that many people uh, are misguided about in terms of physical education and change that race to the bottom to a race to the top. That's the big idea here. That's where we got to take a step back and go, you know what? We can fight and, and be loud about wanting respect, but until we give this the academic rigor and relevancy 
we will never be able to change minds and change the race of the bottom to the race of the top. So this really comes down to taking a step back, maybe doing things a little bit different than what uh, we were taught to do, maybe what we're comfortable with, uh, maybe uh, um, in, in terms of uh, trying new things and the use of technology. But when you marry kinetics and academics together, and you do it in a way that doesn't take away from physical activity, but actually enhances it, and you focus on rigor, relevancy, and enjoyment, you've now made the leap in a different direction, a big leap with a big idea. Now again, I'll go back to that individual walking across the stage. They come in as a freshman in high school, very dependent on doing what they're told to do. But by the time they meet their high school requirements for physical education, we want to make sure that they've met the standards and that they are transformed into someone who feels like they own their physical fitness. They own their health, their well-being. They own what they have to do. It's not they, they understand that they need to be active, and they do it because they understand that importance, and they want it, not because someone's told them what to do. If we can do that, we have unlocked it. We've found the key. We've reached each of those individuals in terms of the big idea. The heart of the next big thing in physical education, we really feel is blended, and that, and that means having online content, but also very active individuals who are enjoying what they're doing, that find it relevant, that understand it's not just a check mark on a transcript. It's not just something I have to do to graduate but it's something that I need to be doing for the rest of my life. So here's how the story continues. What did I learn? I learned to move. Brock, Ronnie, Anna Catherine, Neil, and every one of your students. I hope I've opened your mind to the possibilities of blended learning for physical education. And I hope that you're ready to take your next step towards the next big thing. And I want to help you with that a little bit here. Um, we have a course uh, that basically uh, is for teachers. It's called Introduction to E-Learning for Physical Education. Uh, it's an online self-paced, uh, uh, no cost. It's uh, great for professional development and earning uh, continuing education credits. And uh, I would be glad to offer that to uh, uh, each of you, to your colleagues, if you want to share this is uh, not only a way to uh, um, uh, meet those professional development uh, requirements, but to really uh, uh, embrace blended learning from the perspective of a student. So basically, we take you through the course, or you take yourself through the course, just as if you were a high school student, so you can experience it. Two things teachers have told me time and time again when they've taken this course. One, they've learned some things, or more importantly, they've relearned some things that perhaps over time they've forgotten. Two, this has made them step back and reevaluate their own personal fitness. That tells me right there that this course is about a lifetime of healthy physical activity. When we can get physical educators to take a step back and reevaluate where they are on their health and well-being journey. So go and visit Interactive PE, uh, our website, and you can uh, learn more about uh, the uh, uh, professional development opportunity um, as well as sign up. Or, as you can see, uh, you can just contact me at my email here, and I'd be glad to uh, um, get you signed up and send you a username and a password, and you're off on your own. Anyway, um, I've done this presentation uh, at the uh, Indiana AFERD Association Conference, uh, as well as uh, Shape America, um, a national um, uh, webinar earlier this year. And so I know many of the questions uh, that I've received before, and I want to anticipate some of those here and, and go through a couple of uh, Q&As for you. Um, one of the questions that people ask is, hey, this is great, but are any students using this? Um, actually, last year, uh, the last school year, we had over 5,000 students uh, uh, take the courses with great success. Um, and uh, already here in uh, mid-August, we have more than 5,000 signed up for just the uh, fall semester. So I think uh, uh, given the number of schools that uh, are still coming 
and the ones that uh, will uh, be joining us in the second semester uh, will probably be uh, closer to uh, uh, 15 to 20,000 students uh, this year. Um, another question uh, that we have is, uh, does our school need to be one-to-one? -one? Um, actually, it's very interesting. We, we are in schools that are one-to-one. -one. We're in schools that are BYOD. We're in schools that uh, have no technology uh, strategy or infrastructure. This is all in the cloud, so uh, there is no need for devices. There's no need for uh, the technology department. Um, basically, when you say, hey, I want my students to do this, uh, uh, we give you, just as uh, for the course you're going to take, a username and a password for each student, and they're off and running. Um, so and the next question that gets asked uh, is, uh, well, you know what? Some of our students don't have internet access, so how are they going to do this? Um, every school we go into, this question is asked. There is always that student uh, that may have a situation where uh, they don't have uh, um, uh, internet access at home. A principal really brought this home for me, though, um, and it has been true in every school that we've been in. Uh, whether it's a very rural school, we have a, a school that has, uh, has 800 miles of gravel roads. Talk about the last mile in terms of internet connection. We're in very urban environments with 90% free and reduced lunch uh, student population. And in every situation, the question comes up, but the answer is, these digital natives have figured out how to get connected. They do their Facebook and their Instagram and their Twitter and all the other things that are going on. Uh, one way or another, they are connected. And in that situation where they may not be connected, that's where teachers shine. That's where schools shine. There are resources in terms of uh, media centers, libraries, computer labs, uh, where this can be done. Some schools have uh, uh, the ability, or uh, some teachers uh, will, will hand out uh, loaner uh, um, uh, tablets or whatever it may be. Students do this on their phone. We have many students who love to do this, uh, just uh, the whole course on their phone. I wouldn't do it myself, but that's that's what they do here. Um, next question, well, how do you manage uh, uh, motor skill instruction and assessment? Um, obviously, that's the kinetic curriculum, and the great thing about this is that regardless of what your kinetic curriculum is, this academic curriculum applies. We, however, have baked into the course a uh, fitness evaluation for the student to do at the beginning and the end of the semester. Uh, we go over five uh, basic areas, uh, balance, uh, cardio, strength, uh, core, and flexibility, uh, with the primary test that uh, you're probably very familiar with. We really uh, encourage schools to uh, do at least the uh, first one uh, as a part of, uh, of, of the kinetic curriculum, as part of in-class. Uh, and then to leave the second one, whether you want to do that in class or have the student do that on their own. Again, when they exit, we want them to be independent. So doing it on their own is not a bad idea. Um, and the idea here is not to grade on how fast they can run the mile or how many push-ups they can do. The idea here is for them to have a good understanding of where their fitness is in relation to their peer group and their cohorts. Uh, next question. Well, how do you ensure that the students are actually watching those video lessons? Um, I guess the answer is, is uh, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Um, and and I'd go back to any teacher and go, well, when you're lecturing, how do you know that they're actually listening to you? And it's really kind of the same question. But what we found is that, uh, you know, you saw those uh, questions at the end of each lesson. Students learn in a hurry that the quickest way to get through the course with the best grade is to spend that three, four, or five minutes really attentively watching the lesson, getting through the questions and getting them right the first time. If they don't get those questions right the first time, what do they got to do? They got to go back and they got to listen to the lesson to figure out what the information is. And then they got to take the quiz again. And they're going to get the average of two grades, which is going to be less than if they uh, had done it right the first time. So the quickest and best way to do it is to watch the videos. And, and I think the, most of the kids figure that out in a hurry. Um, next question, uh, how, how do you suggest we close the gap of education uh, uh, with old school thinking? You, you know, that's a, it's a very good question. Um, I find physical educators that are some of my best blended learning teachers are ones that have been teaching for 30 some years and have been very sports oriented. I won't use the term roll out the ball, but uh, you know they all of a sudden 
start using blended learning and they go, oh my gosh, I get it now. And, and they start to see some of the students that maybe are less than athletic that may have been invisible to them before. It really is an eye opener there. But it, you, it really comes down to there has to be at least an opening, an opportunity to, uh, uh, to be open to new ideas. Uh, if someone is old school, I don't think that uh, um, uh, one particular uh, idea is going to change the old school thinking. So the seed's got to be there, but uh, we can nurture those uh, uh, ideas that there is a better way uh, to do things. Um, how much does this cost? Um, right now, uh, as I, I mentioned before, uh, five teachers come. Uh, uh, we'll give this to you and, and let you uh, bring it in your school and evaluate with your students at no cost uh, or investment uh, on your part at all. Uh, we are, quite frankly, uh, um, reevaluating our, our cost structure. Uh, where if we find big school districts with multiple high schools, small schools, uh, um, and, and everything in between with one or more teachers, uh, more buildings, uh, depending on the number of courses uh, that are required in each state and that sort of thing. So it's really difficult to say, but uh, you know what I will tell you is that uh, every school that has started uh, using this has continued. 100% of the schools that have used blended learning have, once they've tried it, they go, we can never go back. So the value is definitely there. Uh, and uh, quite frankly, we are we're working with school districts uh, because we know they'd rather invest in some of those other um, uh, high stakes uh, subjects than physical education, but uh, we want to make sure that they have an offer they can't refuse, and, and that's really you know the uh, the idea here. Um, can I talk with teachers using blended learning? Absolutely, uh, they are they are my uh, best advocates. Um, you know they've been on the front line. They see what works. They know uh, 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 the perspective, and uh, um, I'd be happy to have you talk to, uh, uh, I can put you in touch with uh, many, many different uh, teachers, uh, young and old. Again, you can try it, um, and, and I encourage you to do that. Um, if you have any questions, please uh, contact me. You have uh, my contact information. Uh, I'd love to continue the conversation with you, um, and uh, be glad to get you any information that you uh, need. So I want to uh, thank you so much for your time today and for uh, uh, learning more about what's the next big thing in physical education. Have a great day. Major, I'm sorry, I pointed to you the wrong way, but that's a wrap. So now let's go out and hit those Indiana roads.